Excellent. Well, um, welcome all to the initial session of Regenerate 2022. Um, this morning, we have uh, George Witten and Bridger uh, Rardin. Did I see your, say your last name right, Bridger? It's, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, joining us for a session called Leasing Our Future in a Changing World. Um, a lease is defined in the dictionary as a, a contract between which uh, one party conveys land, property, services, et cetera, to a second party for a specified time, usually in return for periodic payment. There's a great deal of room for innovative thinking in that definition, which is why understanding leasing is so important to a young person who may not own land, livestock, or equipment for starting a business. In this workshop, we will discuss how to take grazing skills you have, uh, you may have, and combine them with a leasing opportunity. Uh, George and Bridger will share what it, uh, what makes for a win-win grazing relationship and how a lease provides clarity and structure uh, for that relationship. Um, they will also discuss some of the economics behind leasing land and discuss some of the unconventional leases that are being implemented in a constantly changing agricultural landscape. Um, the intended audience here is uh, beginning or aspiring ranchers who are in their first 10 years of their career, but I imagine that um, if there are those of you who are at a different stage uh, in your um, trajectory in agriculture, that this will be valuable for you all the same. So uh, welcome. Um, before we get started and before I turn the floor over to George and Bridger, I'd like to say thank you to our many, many sponsors. Uh, we have a very generous crew of folks who support this event. Um, so this is who they are. Uh, and um, they're also on our website. So uh, we'd just like to say thank you to them for making all of this possible. Um, before we dive in, I think most of us are very adept at this point in uh, life living through a pandemic um, that we have all been on a lot of Zoom calls, but I'm gonna talk through really quickly some very basic uh, tools for being on a, a Zoom webinar. Um, if you are on the phone and you need to unmute yourself or mute yourself, the way to do that is pushing star six on your phone. Um, uh, Please um, uh, feel free to turn your camera on or off as needed. Uh, if you need to step away from your screen for some reason or you're doing something distracting, please consider turning your camera off. Um, uh, also, please consider leaving yourself muted if you've got background noise happening. Um, for those of you who may be calling in, another important thing to know is that uh, to raise your hand if you've got a question, star nine is what you press. Uh, for those of you who are on the screen, um, you should see a little uh, toolbar at the bottom of your screen um, and there should be a, uh, an option there. Let's see, where is it? Reactions. If you click the more button and hit reactions, you should be able to raise your hand there. Um, I messed up and went back forward. Uh, <laughs> Let me see if I can figure out how to go back a slide. No, it's not gonna do it. Now it's gonna go forward. Sorry, hold on. Let me figure out how to. There we go. All right. Um, there are several different ways to view your screen. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you should see um, some, a little dash and then a box and then two boxes stacked on top of each other and then nine squares. If you wanna look at everybody who's on the call, you can hit the gallery view. Um, also encourage you to take a moment to click the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of your uh, little square and um, make sure that your name is correct. I encourage you to put in what your preferred pronouns are and if you have, um, a uh, affiliation that you'd like to put in there, you're, you're welcome to do that also. Okay, moving forward. So um, just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. Be aware that everyone can see your comments. If you wouldn't say it to someone in person, please don't say it in the chat. 
If you have an issue of any kind, please me message the host privately. That would be me or Lynn or Susanna Dennison uh, from American Farmland Trust. And thanks, Susanna, for being with us today. Um, please take care of yourself. If you need to step away from the computer, no worries. Get some water, stretch, uh, go to the bathroom, but leave your headphones by your computer. <laughs> turn on your computer uh, or turn it off depending on what you need. All right, so some social agreements during our, our call this morning, please be present, speak from your experience, listen to learn and give others space to talk, uh, make comments to amplify value and respond to the prompt, uh, commit to learning, not debating, persuading or criticizing. We're all in a space during Regenerate to learn from one another. Offer constructive criticism of ideas, not of individuals. Uh, avoid blame, speculation, and inflammatory language, and generalizing certain social groups. All right, uh, at Kibira um, and during the Regenerate Conference, we like to offer land acknowledgement. Um, right now, I'd love to invite you all to offer a land acknowledgement in the chat. Um, if you know uh, what is the uh, history and who are the traditional indigenous people uh, of the land that you are on. Um, I am at Polk's Folly Farm, what is currently known as Polk's Folly Farm in San Antonito, New Mexico, which is the traditional homeland of the Tano and Tiwas people, um, and feel very privileged to be here um, on their land. So, please have fun, be curious, find joy, stay connected, and I think that we are about to dive in and get started. Um, I think that is my last slide. So thank you for bearing with me for the introduction and I will go ahead and uh, turn it over to Bridger and George. Thanks for being with us this morning. Well good morning everyone. Uh, I'm George and uh, we ranch in the in the San Luis Valley primarily in Colorado and as uh, Traditionally, was land of the of the Ute tribe as well as Navajo, and uh, it's a very wonderful place to live and work. and uh, And in my career, I have leased land uh, all over uh, parts of Colorado and in northern New Mexico, and uh, from all kinds of different entities, from the state land boards to the to the uh, uh, tribes and worked with all kinds of different entities and individuals, some crazy, some not. And uh, so we've had uh, quite a bit of experience. And so I want to introduce you to Bridger here, who is, was an apprentice of ours two years ago and is now staff. And he also has done a great job of putting together leases over the years uh, with individuals to, to run his operation. So together, what we're going to try to do is give you a an overview of how to put together a lease and basically not focus too much on the actual numbers or things in the lease, but the concept and try to get the concept down of what makes a good lease. Like George said, I, my name is Bridger Rarden. Um, I'm originally from Laramie, Wyoming. Um, and grew up uh, on ans the ancestral lands of the Sh Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota Sioux uh, tribes. And like he said, I've uh, been in the ag business for quite a while and have uh, experienced leasing land uh, with my dad back in Laramie, Wyoming. And then most recently, I've been running a grazing lease for George in, in New Mexico. Lynn, are we sharing our, um, our uh, PowerPoint through here? Because I can't see it on. I was just waiting for you to let me know. Okay, yeah, we're. I think we're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready. Okay, okay. One. Can kind of skip over this first slide since we already did our introduction. Okay. 
Yeah, that was one that sort of, Sarah sort of went over this slide a little bit ago, but it, basically as I uh, described a little bit ago, you know, a lease is defined in the dictionary and it, it's, a, it's a way that people make an agreement before they start into a, to a, to a, an actual work, working together that sort of sets up the boundaries for what it is they expect and uh, what they what they want to do in the end, and they, in, in the end, should have a goal that is that results in a symbiotic relationship between land, livestock, and people. And that that's always a good lease if you can get that done, and you can communicate in the meantime and set up a way to to, to it's basically a living contract. And uh, so. Uh, that's what we're going to try and, and uh, describe to you today, and hopefully we get some questions, and if you have some specific things you want to learn about, we can hope help with that as well. And I'd also add that, you know, leases can be very informal and can be done on a handshake, um, but uh, speaking from personal experience, that can be uh, very dangerous, and I think we're going to kind of illustrate through the rest of this PowerPoint why writing it down um, and having a, a good contract is is imperative to a good lease. Next slide. So uh, one of the things you want to start out with is what does each party need from one another? As I, I mentioned a little bit ago, you need to know what your end goal is and to sit down and talk with the person or, or the entity, whatever it is, about what you need from one another. And, and then you of course need to understand what kind of animal you're gonna graze and how many and how long. And it, these leases are sort of divided into three basic things of, of, of why and how much and how long. And if you can get those concepts down on paper, uh, that's a good place to start. Um, and then there are any specific land management goals or parameters, like is there a conservation easement? Do they need weed control? Is it a riparian area? Are there, are there you know, uh, things that the, the landowner is very specific and wants and uh, understanding those kind of things. Are there cert certifications that need to be maintained like organic certification or GAP4 or some of the other certifications that people have with land and, and livestock these days. Uh, is there a, a, an Audubon certification, for instance, all those kind of things and understanding those are, are critical in having a successful lease. And then are there specific animal goals? Is this lease gonna be based on rate of gain of the animals or is it gonna be on maintenance? Uh, through the winter or is it you know what are the goals of that of the livestock owner as well as the landowner and then based on those parameters you need to determine some sort of a payment and whether it's going to be based on cash flow on monthly weekly or annually and so you understand how these how these payments are gonna be. So there, there are several ways to do this. And I think uh, also you know helping define everything within that lease, um, sitting down with the landowner, livestock owners, and kind of initiating meetings so that you can get a really clear understanding of, of what their needs are, and also be able to communicate what your needs are as maybe a grazer or a um, you know, livestock owner. And, and having that clear communication um, between all the parties involved really goes a long way so that you can clearly state everything that needs to be stated in that lease. You can go to the next slide. So writing it down is, is one of the most critical things you can do. Um, it really clarifies detail, um, time, care, payment, all those things. Um, it also states what is agreed upon and allows hopefully for changes in the agreement so that they, it can be handled in a positive manner and it doesn't lead to big disagreements or where you have to get some sort of uh, mitigation type deal in, in place. Um, it also really helps understanding liability and legality um, for you know, the lessee and the lessor. And a written lease is, is basically your reference when it's time to settle up. 
um, if there's been any challenges or disagreements and that, that's where, uh, you know, you can hopefully create that win-win situation is by having that reference. Um, and then once again, like I've stated, the open dialogue um, that promotes effective communication between all the parties involved is one of the most critical, th critical things you can, can be doing. And I, I just might add that things always change in the middle of these leases. And, and so having a, an open dialogue, as he just mentioned with your, with your partners in this lease is critical because everybody needs to understand what's going on and, and why. And, uh, you know, almost never did things work out quite the way everybody thought. And so you, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that that's bad. It just means that you have a, you have a clear path forward. And I would add to that too, like from our own experience, uh, working with the lease that we had in New Mexico this year that I was managing for George, you know, when you're the person on the ground, um, you probably are the, the one that's seeing everything and, and doing a lot of that communication. And when you're in a, a complex system like the ranch that we're running, you know, you got to, on my end, I need to be relaying everything back to George and my other team members. And, you know, it's not just communication with the landowners or whatever um, party that you're leasing from, but it's also communication within your team. So, you know, everything can, can get done and you can be effective at, at your job. Next. So as a young agrarian, you know, what do you have to offer? I think that's that's a question that you really need to ask yourself. Um, you know, do you have experience in grazing planning and executing that for land health? Um, you know, how many years of animal care and health, animal health and land health assessment, um, you know, do you have so that you can step into a, a leasing situation and, and really um, have the knowledge to kind of keep you from hitting rough spots? Um, you know. What kind of labor um, can, can you also provide fencing, water setup, maintenance on the property? Um, and then, you know, I think within a younger generation, uh, we may be a little bit better at communication, open communication than our older gener generation, but, you know, you, you still have to be very proactive. And I think something that I recall when I first got into leasing land at a very young age, you know, 19, 20 years old was kind of a fear to, to be proactive with communication and to, to not voice concerns or voice the things that I needed to voice. And so I, I think that also ties into, you know, having the confidence to, to say what needs to be said, even if you are um, younger and working with the older generation. And then, you know, as well with, with youth, I think create creativity and problem solving is, is a kind of an asset and our minds are a little bit more elastic. And so, you know, let's use that. And then of course, enthusiasm, strength, and en energy is something that I hope at least most young people should always be able to bring to the table. And, and to that, I would add as somebody who might be leasing or working with a, a younger person like that is that coming uh, with solutions sometimes rather than just with problems is really uh, important. So if you've thought something through and you you have and can offer a solution uh, as well as describing whatever the problem might be, that's always that's always very helpful. And so there are different kinds of leases to think about. There's a, there's a lease between the landowner and the livestock owner, and uh, and then there's leases that are between land and the livestock owners and the custom grazer who uh, is not the livestock owner. And then uh, between grazer and livestock owner, that, you know, these different combinations of, of things you can do. And then between land and, and uh, livestock owner and the grazer on, on a cash, on a share basis. And, a lease can be created to fit almost any situation. That's a great thing about leasing is that you don't have to own things, but you can you can use them uh, for uh, for some sort of trade. And that, that there's there's no limit to the ways that these things can be put together, given the the.
creativity of the people involved. I would, you know, when you're thinking about all these different types of leases, as the, the leasee, I would also, you know, want to be thinking about how can you mark, you know, what assets do you have and how can you market yourself within whatever community that you're in um, so that you can, can go out and, and get a, a good lease. And you might, when I talk about marketing, you know, I'm, are you going to go out and post a classified ad? Are you going to use like word of mouth within your community or social media maybe, or even going around and, you know, cold calling uh, people where you see that there might be an opportunity. Like here in the San Luis Valley where George and I are at, there is a lot of, a lot of farm ground in the area. And, you know, I think we, we've already started working with some farmers to, uh, you know, uh, basically harvest cover crops with cattle and, and promote soil health and, and several other things. But you know, is that is that a, maybe an opportunity that other people can jump on too, and and be thinking about how how you market yourself to a, a farmer and and how you describe what that situation might look like, so that you could kind of get that collaboration and work together. Next slide, Lynn. So I sort of covered this a little bit here while ago. Is that. Uh, you know, you get a client by being the solution to their problem. And, and so you need to know what their concerns, their needs, and their challenges are. Next. We can go to the next, yeah. yeah. So this is, um, you know, creative leases and solutions for landowners. Um, like we stated, you need to figure out what their goals and needs are. Um, communication is everything and plan around those challenges to create those win-win situations. Um, this year, George and I together worked on a, a grazing lease in, in New Mexico that was a little unorthodox, um, where we actually traded management for in lieu of financial compensation um, for the, the grazing lease. And, you know, that's one of those creative ways that you can maybe provide solution, a solution to a landowner's problem. In our case, they wanted to manage holistically and regeneratively, but did not have the skill set to either hire uh, the correct people or do it themselves. And so we, that's how we were a solution to one of their problems. And hopefully working into the future with this ranch, uh, we're, we're looking at doing some other creative things like offering educational opportunities on the ranch, maybe adding another livestock species that fits um, those landowners goals. And it all kind of is, is part of building that relationship with those landowners, reading the situation and then approach and letting them know, you know, kind of where we come from too and what, what our needs are. I think that's one thing that gets left behind sometimes is, is that, you know, for it to be win-win, both parties need to understand um, where everyone's coming from. Next slide, Lynn. And before we get into this too much, I wonder if anybody has questions right now. Uh, I can't tell if there's anything in the chat box, but uh, might just sort of take a moment here. And if there's somebody who has a burning question they'd like to ask right now before we sort of get into these, these next uh, set of slides. We don't have any questions. We'll go ahead and start okay. to jump into this. So uh, you need to, you know, think about what the landowner wants and and what they need. And so there are all kinds of. We have several examples here of things that they might want and things that have evolved basically in the grazing world in the last ten or fifteen years that didn't actually exist uh, not too long ago. And so things like file for uh, fire and fuel load reduction in increasing biodiversity, uh, increasing carrying capacity. Uh, having a grazing plan is really important. So if you have some experience in building a grazing plan and you know how, how to present that to a landowner, that's gonna be very impressive to them if they understand that it helps them get an idea what their carrying capacity might be. And if they don't know, uh, there's carbon markets and carbon offset things. Uh, I don't do much of that, so I don't know a whole lot about that, but that is out there. 
and there's soil and water, uh, the, the health man, soil health and how that affects water uh, retention. And uh, for us, that's a key thing because water, we have to pay for water here now. And so being able to get by on less water and get more production by building soil organic matter is critical. And that, that's one of the things that we work with potato farmers who have to dig the soil up when they, when they uh, dig their potatoes. So that water holding capacity and water retention in a, on, a, on a highly productive farm is critical. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, being payment on time, always pay on time and, and, and stay current, don't get behind. Uh, take care of the facilities, maintain the fences, maintain the gates, pick things up, keep it clean. Uh, some people like need an agricultural status for their property taxes rather than residential or, or you know, um, there's a lot of tax breaks for people with property, especially in these uh, beautiful ranch country where they, they need to have livestock on there. And stability uh, is, is that's a key thing you know everybody's looking for something that's stable that's repeatable and that you can do year to year um they also want their land to be aesthetically uh pretty and uh good relations with the neighbors bridger is a great relationship builder with the neighbors around that ranch down there that's a big part of his job is getting along with the people next door and uh, getting the land enrolled programs that to bring diversified income, things like Audubon or uh, organic certification or things like that. NRCS programs, uh, stewardship uh, programs that are available, all those kind of things. And the thing you need to do as a grazer is ensure that you have enough water per head for these animals when you move on to a graze set. At least that's the first thing that I look for is to see what the water supply is because that will that will doesn't matter how much feed is there if they don't have enough water that's available in a reliable way that's a key thing that's the first place to look and uh, and then that just brings security for the landowner's land all those things above and I would add you know on the <laughs> good relations with neighbors um, you know something to think about too is some of these leases that you might get into, it is with an absentee landowner that um, you know, doesn't necessarily have a, a whole lot um, of involvement with that local community. And you kind of have to be that person which is that gap for them and, and makes it so that they have good, you know, their neighbors want to treat them well and vice versa. And it can, it, it can get dicey in some some places in the West still, unfortunately. So really being able to negotiate that and um, kind of blend it so you're really trying to be part of that community is, is very important. And then not only drinking water, but irrigation water and, and the way that whether or not this person's involved in an acequia, for instance, and how that whole thing works, or whether they're on a community canal system where that irrigation works or it's a groundwater system where there are strict rules about how much water can be removed and how, how you have to pay for that water. So you need to understand all those things going in. I would recommend to anyone that's getting into a lease as well, go ahead and read all, all the state laws where the lease is on those state water laws and the state fencing laws because that that's a, if, if you do so, if you mess up on one of those deals, it can be a, a pretty big deal it can cause you know risk with with neighbors and that's really the last thing you want want to to be dealing with especially if you're a newcomer in that community you want to start, start out on a strong strong note okay next slide so this is just a the sort of the mirror image of that of back what what what, what would the livestock owner if you're a grazer who is in between the landowner and the livestock owner, or you're a landowner and trying to make a deal with a livestock owner, you need to think about what that livestock owner needs. And they, they obviously need the forage. That's why they're there in the first place. They need that reliable water that, that uh, I mentioned before. 
and they may you need to understand whether they're just trying to maintain animals or they need weight gain for their animals if they're yearlings and they need to gain uh, they have a target of one and a half or two two pounds a day how, how do you achieve that uh, do they have an organic certification they need healthy animals obviously and they need somebody to look at them every day and sort of make sure that they stay that way pay attention to the individuals as well as the herd um, they may need long-term recovery from grazing restoration for land health depending on how the place has been treated before or whether there's been a fire or a flood or any one of the other many things that happened uh, they need of course minimal death loss but understanding there will always be some and uh they, or are they going to background replacements or heifer development you know uh keeping the neighbor's bulls out of heifers uh, making sure that if they are using your there are bulls in the herd that they're in good shape and they're doing their job um and of course then you you, know, you need to make sure their cattle are secure that they're fence and there's water infrastructure and who's responsible for that and then dealing with trucking and transportation to and from the lease and who's responsible for that you need to understand the paperwork whether there's commuter herd permits or there's health inspections crossing state lines uh, or brand inspections there's always a brand inspection usually when an animal is moved more than 70 miles inside of a, 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 dist a brand district uh, and then, like we mentioned a little bit for breeding and, uh, you know, that livestock owner is obviously interested in that or not having any, depending on the class of livestock. And monitoring animals and forages. Next slide, Lynn. She, she oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. So what does the grazer want and need? You know, I think the first thing they need to be thinking about is how do you get land access? And that's probably the, the hardest thing and the, the first place to start. Um, then you need a clarity about liability, you know, like working with George, you know, I'm, I was liable this year for, you know, any strays or, or death loss. That's not the landowners, you know, they don't have to be reimbursed or, they don't have to reimburse George for any death loss. I fortunately didn't either, but we had kind of talked about, you know, what, what percent death loss do I need to keep things under? And, you know, if maybe I go over, maybe I would be liable in some instances. It all depends about the contract that you have. You know, you also need to really understand the landowner's goals um, so that you can, <coughs> you can actually go out with your grazing and have that plan to achieve what they want to see. Um, of course, you also need to be thinking about profitability. Um, you, you can't do it if you aren't profitable at the end of the day. You, you gotta have, and a lot of times with a grazer, you need to have some pretty steady cash flow um, so that you can, can stay afloat and cover your bills and, and take care of everything that needs to be taken care of on a month to month, week to week basis. Um, and then another big thing is, you know, managing for climate and weather variability. Um, I got lucky this fall when we shipped out that I never got stuck in a snowstorm, but had to be thinking about, you know, plans on what if it did snow, where, where are my cattle going? What am I going to be doing? And, you know, also with weather, another thing to think about, depending on where you're at um, and your soil type, you, you need to be kind of thinking about management and how, how to not hug up a bunch of ground or tear up a bunch of ground when after a big rain or something like that. Um, you also need to be thinking about the land that you're on and what that time frame of that grazing lease can be. Um, you, you don't wanna bring cattle on too early before there's not enough green grass and you really have to kind of think about carrying capacity, stocking rate and that time frame all together. Um, and then, of course, you need to have respect for the terms of the contract. Not feeling pressured into understocking, undergrazing, or overgrazing, or overstocking. And I think that um, is pretty important and something that needs to be addressed with the landowner and the livestock owner so that you know kind of everyone's goals on what they, that aesthetic value that they want on the land and then the you know, of course, the aesthetic value on the, the livestock, which I think everyone would want fat, fat livestock at the end of the day. Um, you also need to have information on the animals you're running, the health history, 
Um, are you going to be vaccinating anything for the livestock owner? Um, are you trying to put on weight on those animals? And if you are, you need to have those animals weighed before they come in and weighed when they come off. And, you know, hopefully over time, you're also keeping track of all that so that you can kind of have a, a good uh, guesstimate year in, year out on what the land can actually do for you. Um, water, infra water and infrastructure, you know, if you're a guy that's out leasing land and you've never irrigated that land before, um, you, you need to have some, probably a, a couple weeks of just learning on how that irrigation system works and, and realizing that it's, you're not going to irrigate it perfectly the first probably two to three years. And um, so that might also hurt your stock, your carrying capacity overall. But, uh, you know, really, really uh, learning how that works will will add add to the, the entire lease um, down the road. And then, of course, knowing how to communicate with the owners, um, livestock and landowners, um, and having a good relationship with them is huge. Um, knowing your vet and your brand inspector is a big one, especially if you're in an area that um, you haven't been in before, calling the brand inspector, introducing yourself, calling a vet, introducing yourself uh, before you even maybe have to get a brand inspection or take anything to the vet um, so that they kind of already know who you are and, and um, what you're doing in the community. And then once again, understanding those brand laws and knowing the brand inspector um, and yeah, record keeping is another big thing. Have records of, of your movements so that you can kind of take that back to your um, pasture plan and um, you know have context for what you planned and then what you actually got and then use that for, for future planning purposes. Okay, next slide. So one of the first things you're going to have to figure out is what's the carrying capacity of that location. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, you, can, you can look for institutional knowledge, people that are around there who've been running livestock and, and have an idea. Uh, also, there you can use the NRCS soil web survey. Uh, and uh, you need to... You need to learn to understand how to, to think in animal units, which are 1,000 pound animal units, because basically what you're doing is you're taking forage and putting it into an animal that weighs a certain amount. And you need to allocate about 3% of that animal's body weight for forage every day. So that's a, that's a good place to start looking at it. And, uh, and then understanding what class of animals, whether it's cow-calf pairs or whether it's yearlings or it's sheep or goats or uh, maybe pigs, chickens. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to, to utilize grass. And so understanding what those animals need and how to set up a, a, a system that works for them and you is, is very important. You need to know who's gonna care for the infrastructure and and if you need to supply your own fencing or whether the livestock owner or the landowner has that stuff, um, you need to think about how many hours of labor do you need to get the job done weekly or daily and how much, you know, to set up and take down. And you, you probably, if you've done this, you've probably done some of that where you're at and you have some understanding of what that, how much labor that actually takes. And then you need to think about how far do you have to drive to and from the lease and the time that that takes. And uh, how many hours are spent planning the process, setting at home, doing a pasture plan, monitoring uh, and taking photos and keeping track of what's going on and documenting that. And, and then can you run enough animals to make it pay? In the end, it has to cash flow for you and uh, so if it's a part-time job and you have another job, then having a, an operation that's small enough or easy to handle in, a, in the mornings, and then you can you know, do something in the afternoon or evening if you need to hold down a couple of jobs. But these kind of things can easily fit in with another job. And I would also just uh, some places uh, that you can go to um, get a carrying capacity or get some, an idea of what it may be 
is a web soil survey, which is online. They have some carrying capacity um, kind of forage estimates. Um, State Extension is another great um, outlet to, to go and, and get some, some of that institutional knowledge. NRCS, um, you know, just if there's any historical records of what uh, previous uh, grazers or, or landowners, livestock owners have gotten off that land. Um, and then also, of course, you can go out, there's a the SAC method, which is promoted by holistic management, and that can kind of be an on the ground um, estimate that you can go out and do. And then you can also clip and weigh to, to get some of those estimates as well. Next slide, Lynn. So here's a, an example of, of making it pay. And I think this is, uh, this is kind of off of some ranching for profit stuff. Um, but it's uh, something good to be thinking about. And I think they structure it in a way um, that is, is good, is a good way to think about it from a business um, perspective. So kind of the, the main thing is you need to understand your gross profit. You need to understand your direct costs. And those direct costs are basically the costs that um, are tied to each unit um, that you run. And then your overhead costs, which are sometimes kind of your fixed costs, um, but you know your gross profit minus direct costs minus overheads is your net profit, and that's that's what you that's what's going to kind of make or break the business at the end of the day is that net profit. So in this example, we have our overhead costs, and it's coming in at sixty four thousand, roughly a little over sixty four thousand dollars. These overhead costs. Um, we have our land lease, which is a typical overhead. We have our labor and our wages, which is another overhead. Fuel is another one. Maintenance, temporary fencing, and potentially insurance. Um, in this example, you can see what our land lease ends up being um, on an annual basis, what our wages are. And so all those combined is your overheads. And then our direct costs are the ones that um, we have for, you know, our the animals that we may have in in a uh, kind of a grazer situation where you might have a horse that you need to be feeding hay to every day. So there's costs tied to that. You might also have a dog, and you need to be including those costs um, for that dog food and any any vet bills, anything like that. And then you have your gross profit, which is what you end up how many cows you're running, how many animal units they end up being, and then what your rate that you charge to the livestock owner. Um, and when you get all that together and you subtract it all out, you end up in this example with a, a small net profit for the business along with a, a, uh, a salary type wage. Next slide. So in this example, it's, it's the exact same thing. The only difference is rather than doing a lease on an animal unit basis or a cow-calf pair basis, um, it's a flat rate uh, lease agreement. And I think from a planning perspective, these flat rates um, are at times, if you know your carrying capacity and you, um, kind of, and you have a good drought plan in place, the flat rate leases are a little bit easier in my mind to work with because it gives you a, kind of that fixed cost that you know, um, no matter how many cows you bring in, you have to cover that, that dollar amount. Um, and in this example, you can kind of read through it all. And this is one where, um, the scale is a little bit bigger and you can see kind of what all your costs would be, your gross profit, and then you can see your net profit at the end of the day. And um, scaling up is a, a pretty big deal if you want to be doing this full time. You have to, you have to really know what, what your wants are as the grazer or livestock owner or landowner um, so that you, you know what um, you're gonna be making at the end of the day. Next slide. So what do you need to keep yourself out of trouble? Uh, you know, you always want to look for support from uh, 
people in your network and you know Cobera is a great community for support uh, just the fact that you're involved with Cobera in the first place you've already got a leg up on a lot of on a lot of folks because it's a it's a huge network of people who are all thinking about these things and are like-minded and so um you know that that is a a good place technical support and it is nrcs of course is good for for uh different things and carrying capacities and those kind of things uh how to negotiate with uh equip or uh, other um programs that are part of the you know the farm bill that you might be dealing with um uh, and then looking for records from a landowner, a friend to call when you're overwhelmed. And, that, and sometimes, you know, just having somebody to talk to is, is really important. Keep your mental health and your personal well-being, and, you know, because these uh, sometimes can be kind of, there can be a lot of challenges. So having some support is, is going in is, is important. Um, and then, you know, you need to monitor your progress. And, and keep track of your land health and animal performance and and then rec and keep records Re record your expenses uh and and then record the pasture moves and the number of animals that you've had on a on a particular paddock and then keep track of all that so that you can sit down with the landowner or the livestock owner at the end of the year and go over what you've done and then go out and look at the land and see what the results are and, and you have those numbers that you can reference. It's not just something you kept in your head. So, and I would add to that, um, you know, keeping to keep yourself out of trouble, especially financially, uh, you really need, regardless of the size that you start out at, you need to be running your operation as a business and not a hobby. And I think um, that that can be really hard to do when you first start up, but. It is something that if you if you don't run it as a business from the get go, um, you can really end up throwing a lot of money down the drain into something that maybe you should. You, if it's not profitable, you probably shouldn't be doing it in the first place. And um, yeah, and and to remember that you know there's steep learning curves out there, and you will find challenges and and have have struggle when you're getting started. But just having as many resources. Um, at your hand, hands so that you you can reach out and get the help that you do need at the end of the day is, is a big thing. And, and there again, this is a place where having clear communication with everybody involved so that if you are getting in some sort of trouble, you have you feel you're confident to actually call somebody and talk to them. That's a hard thing to do. It's hard to call people and say, you know what, I'm, this is not really working. I need to change some things. And so building that relationship, these leases are all about relationships. And so keeping that, keeping that in mind as you go forward is that's, that's maybe the most important thing is that really that human relationship between you and the people you're working with. And as an example, kind of on that, you know, running in that, on the lease that George and I were, were running down in Northern New Mexico, you know, there hit a point where it was looking like I wasn't going to get the, the original help that I thought I'd get. And being able to have those honest conversations, even though we work together all the time, um, you, you got you to gotta be able to, to talk to your boss or whoever you're working with. And, and if you need help, you need help. And that, that's kind of the bottom line. And, you know, everyone might, might have to push other things back, but at the end of the day, it is, it, it is all about the people. And I think that's a, a big thing to focus on, especially as we move forward into the future with agriculture. Next slide, Lynn. So this is just another uh, much more kind of a formal uh, written up agreement uh this one here is not really it's pretty simple basically but it it is it's got all of the aspects in it that you need to think about and so you you've got you know your time period you've got who it's between uh you've got your 
number of acres and you've got how many animals and what class of livestock like this is a mixed you know 20 to 40 pairs two bulls and 160 yearling and the you know the duration the payment amount what that's going to be per month uh per animal unit remember that an animal unit is a thousand pound animal and uh well it, and that's written down there uh when the payments are due whether they and they're due at the first of the month in this particular contract. Uh, and that the leasees, the person who owned the land will aid in the maintenance of fences and irrigation and pasture rotations and livestock management. So they, they're willing to help the grazer with those movements um, there if needed. Uh, and, uh, and then any other requirements that are not met, uh, you know, will be considered null and void so you know the, 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 the in this case the general manager of blue sky ranch has the has the power to to end this lease at any time if they decide they want to and they did you you agree to that and then basically sign it and i just say this is a, a very simple example um you know a lot of leases are maybe more complex and we have some other examples coming up uh, but you know, the big thing is that it is in, in writing and this, that's, that's a huge part from a legality side. Cause if there is any disagreement, hopefully there's not, um, it, there, there is something there and it's not just a handshake and you, you can kind of manage that liability for yourself that way. Next slide. So this is a, an example of, a. Of a, of a lease that is uh, maybe a little more complicated and it's it's written very legally, you know, with therefore and whereas and you know, those kind of uh, legal terms. And so it's, and it also takes into account who's responsible if somebody gets hurt or if the animals damage something or, you know, it's, it's uh, and it's written out with a lot of detail about how those things work. And you'll run into these kind of leases very often with corporate uh, type entities that own property that you might be leasing from or to. And uh, so that you don't need to be scared by these, but just understand them and that they're usually pretty clear and sometimes more useful than a simple agreement uh, when things happen that you hadn't thought of. And they, they generally try to cover most of those, those situations. Um, basically, same thing though, when you pay, how much, uh, you know, and, and these things can vary. Any lease that you put together is between you and whoever you're working with. Um, so next slide, I just, uh, it's just more of that same lease. It goes on for a couple of pages, you know, uh, but who's, who's, who's responsible for the care the maintenance and the risk uh, for the uh, livestock in this particular case. And, uh, and that means that you've inspected the premises and you know that the caretaker is competent. You know, you've agreed to that. The caretaker should hold the owner harmless from damages for property. And 4.3, all necessary arrangements and costs for trucking. And who's responsible for that? is if the landowner or the livestock owner, uh, any sort of beef check off for the brand inspection, who's going to pay, pay for those kind of things. Um, and then, you know, grazing management and daily care is the caretaker. And so, you know, it's just very clearly written out step by step. Next slide, please. Just same goes on down, you know, just trying, couldn't get it all on one slide. There's about three or four of these slides, I think. Uh, and and that's a, these are just examples and not necessarily, like I say, don't get too involved in the actual numbers, but think about the concepts and think about the way that people sort of generally describe these concepts and these relations with one another. And and then whether or not this is somebody that you can deal with face to face, or it's a it's a corporation somewhere that you'll never really see anybody. Uh, so, um, 
that's that's the great thing about leases and contracts there they are malleable to work with all kinds of situations next slide and i'd i'd also add just on on uh you know with these grazing leases um you know as personally you know as the grazer grazer this year for george kind of the the middleman on this lease that we had in, in new mexico um you know i i think have a really clear understanding of what is in that lease both for the lease that like george had with the landowners and then also the the contract um that we had together really know the what's in there and what your responsibilities are and you know do do everything then to the best of your ability from there but not just you know don't just glance at, at it and sign it or anything and really really have a complete full understanding of what you're responsible for so that you keep your end of the bargain okay next so what what a landowner should look for in a grazer uh trust that's the first thing i trust bridger implicitly his judgment he's proven himself to be very trustworthy sometimes he's dumb as hell but he's <laughs> trustworthy <laughs> uh, but he's committed he has enthusiasm he's got communication skills he has basic knowledge of the animals, the land. He, he's really good at, at, at plants and understanding them. And uh, he is, uh, you know, good with the animals. He's, he's a stockman. And, you know, he deals with them daily. And I, I just trust him implicitly. And it, it's, it's very comfortable as a land or a livestock owner and a, and a lease or that, that I have trust in that in my people and uh you know that's that's the thing you want to try to get to and and you build that with that communication and, and open and honest and i would add to that too is you know from the the gra grazer standpoint um you know trust isn't going to happen overnight it takes time and you do kind of have to you have to prove yourself and patience is is a virtue in the long run because not nothing is just going to you know, happen at the end of the day. And I think when you're younger and, and getting into ag, um, you kind of want everything to be happening real fast and you want to see all these big improvements and these big changes. And, you know, that's just not the way things really work. It, it, everything takes time and, and you have to, you have to do, you have to really prove yourself at the end of the day. Next. So getting started as a leasee, you know, you need to be thinking about what kind of enterprise are you going to be running and what, you know, what do you want to run? Um, do you want to work with sheep? Do you want to work with cattle? Do you want to work with goats? Uh, there's a, a million different things to be doing. Are you more interested in, in um, you know, becoming a, a chicken farmer and doing direct market uh, eggs and and chicken to a consumer base, and I, you can you can really kind of figure out how how to set up whatever you want to do. You know, if you if you do want to be a chicken farmer, you know maybe there is someone that's already grazing cattle, and they'd love to have that nitro, nitrogen back on their land, and you can work a collaborative deal with the landowner to to do that and and get that land access. Um, you know, who do you know or what resources do you know of that can help you acquire that lease? And I think that's where like Kivira, the, the conference can be a, a big, big deal um, where you can, you can meet other producers, you can meet landowners, you can network. And I think that network is, is what is critical to actually getting into a situation that's going to work for you. Um, you know, figure out what you, you have to offer. What is your skill set, and how do you communicate that effectively to livestock owners and landowners and, and build that, that trust and that relationship with them over time. And, you know, you have to also realize that you're not going to be good at everything. And so maybe at a certain point, there's uh, room to bring in other people that have different skill sets that are, you know, enjoy doing the, those things more than you do or just better at them. And I think that's where that, that teamwork can be a, a huge asset. Um, and then what, you know, assets and resources do you already have 
help you get started? You know, do you own a truck and trailer? Do you have a horse? Maybe do you have a dog, a good herding dog? Um, and then be thinking about all the things that you might still need. You know, of course, land access is probably one of the, those biggest ones, and you got to start there. And then, I mean, another critical aspect is cash flow. You you have to have cash flow. Are you gonna maybe you'll you'll go out and get an operating note um, your your first year because you aren't going to get any income until let's say you're running a custom care deal and you've got one payment in the spring and one payment in the fall and the, the one payment in the spring has to cover all your your overheads and your direct costs and then you don't have any leftover for cash flow so you need an operating note or do you have a second job initially to start out where you can make that up a little bit um then after finalizing a lease Further develop your business model and outline your long-term goals. I think that's a big thing is, is long-term planning, having, having that vision um, and writing it down too, so that you really know um, where you're at and you know what benchmarks you have hit, what benchmarks you haven't, and slowly knocking, knocking those goals down so that you can develop that business into a, a successful enterprise. Um, and of course, be prepared to adapt to change and be flexible. I think in you know, a changing climate, um, that, that adaptability and flexibility is huge. Um, and that can be stressful at times too, but you, you, have to, you have to be able to get outside your comfort zones and, and kind of grow at the end of the day. Anything you'd like to add? Um, on that? Just to add to that, that, uh, you know, as a, if, if uh, Bridger mentioned getting an operating loan and to be borrow ready to go into a bank and talk to a banker about borrowing money for an enterprise like this. You're going to need somebody to co-sign with you probably, potentially uh, the landowner or the livestock owner uh, may help you with that kind of a deal. If you can't come up with the money between those parties, then you have to borrow money from a bank. And uh, that's, that's another serious step that uh, if you're going to do that, you have to be what I call borrow ready. And uh, so when you walk in there, you you can convince that banker that you have the skill and you've done the planning and you can show your steps how you're going to get through this. And uh, that that's, that's a great place to start because being able to borrow money is critical in agriculture if you're going to, you're going to move into ownership or other things down the road. So and I, I would say just on that note too, you know, if you do show up to the banker and you have a financial plan, you have a grazing plan, you have all this, these documents that, that are already done and can show them kind of what you're doing and, and your plan around everything. And also planning around some, you know, risk mitigation, like a drought, drought plan. I think that uh, bankers aren't used, used to that in a lot of, uh, conventional modern day, day ag. And if you can, can really show your, your business um, knowledge, it, it goes a long ways. They seem to be more interested in loaning you money to buy a tractor than loaning you money to buy electric fencing and, and using your skills. So it, it's, if you get the right banker and you have the right message, that, that's important. And that, that's another thing where it, it goes back to the, the people relationships at the end of the day too. Okay, questions. I think we've got some in the chat. Oh, uh, from Ed Kennedy, uh, it says as a, as a landowner, where do you find a grazer? Is there specific resources? Well, Covera Coalition, uh, is a great place to start there. And, um, you know, a lot of these young uh, uh, new agrarians who are coming out of the, of, of the new agrarian program are fairly skilled grazers, especially if they've had two or three years experience on one or, or two or three different ranches. So that's a great place to look uh, to start with. There's also a Colorado uh, Ag uh, Department of agriculture has a, a young agrarian program that's somewhat similar and there may be people there who are interested in be, being grazers and uh, so that's a place where I would start but go to the conference 
and there'll be there'll be a lot of people floating around in there who are all talking about these things. And another great conference if you are looking for grazers or you know livestock owners or landowners is the Grass Fed Exchange, um, and they actually offer up a scholarship fund for a lot of kind of beginning agrarians. Um, and I, I know when I attended um, a while back, it was a, a great place to network and really make some of those connections. And I, I think that is, you know, the, the con not just the Kavira conference, but a lot of kind of more regenerative based uh, agricultural conferences are, are a great place to get started. Got another question from Matthias. Um, the Savory Institute claims that there are currently regenerating 21 million hectares around the globe. Could leaser, leases enter these statistics since they are temporal contract or temporary contracts? Um, I believe, I know like on my dad, dad's and I's operation back in Laramie, we, we enter in all of our, um, our leases um, for like the USDA uh, kind of Oh, they want to know how many head you're running and, and how many acres you're leasing. Um, I don't know enough about the Savory Institute and kind of the what their guidelines are for entering those those uh, contracts in into that that number that 12, 21 million hectare number. But that might be a good question for Sarah. I don't know the answer to that question either, but um, I think that, that we'll have some folks from the Savior Institute there and we can ask them. I think it's a really relevant question because I think that um, duration of the lease may have a lot to do with sort of whether it can um, sort of fall into that, is it being regenerated or not? Uh, I learned last year or the year before that uh, about 40% of ag land in this country is leased and uh, something like greater than 80% only have year to year leases. Um, and so, you know, that may impact the type of uh, long term uh, infrastructure or long term planning that a lessee is willing to put into whatever that piece of ground is. And so, um, you raise a really good, but I think a kind of complicated question. So um, I would say if you're gonna come to the conference in person, let's definitely seek out the savory folks and uh, ask them, cause I don't know. Uh, and then I do see that we have the 505-347, maybe that is sunny, I'm not sure, but your hand is raised. And if you wanna come off mute and ask your question. Oh, you're muted again. Try one more time. I saw you come off mute. There you go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, good morning to all of you. Um, I'm Navajo from the Four Corners region. And I'm just wondering um, across the Western part of the United States where there are Indian territories and reservations and reserves, um, are any of those lands leasable or are any tribes participating in leasing their lands to cattle people? I know that Navajo Nation as a government entity has ranches, um, but I don't know who is on those ranches. It's just a curious question that I have. You don't have to know the answer, but I'm just curious. Just and, from my experience this summer, working uh you know i the ranch that i we were leasing was very close to the hickoria uh, apache reservation and talking with several tribal members um there and and whatnot they i was under the impression and how they talked about it is that those lands that are owned by the the reservation or the tribe usually are leased back to tribal members i did not they they never talked about any anything along the lines of anyone outside from the tribe leasing those lands. But I know the tribal members still that lease the land back from the, the tribe, they, they still have to pay a small grazing fee, which is a, oh, pretty equivalent to like the BLM United States uh, Forest Service rates. 
I, I am aware of, I, there might be the Mescalero Apache uh, down uh, one of my past apprentices, leased uh, a, a lease from them for several years. Uh, so I think it varies tribe to tribe. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't, uh, but it, it's, it, has, it, it is done, uh, but it, it varies and I, I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think you're right, George. And I think that increasingly there are tribes that are um, working to prioritize um, tribal lessees. Uh, but it, yeah, I think it varies from tribe to tribe how they manage leases and if they lease. But I do know that there are a number of tribes that um, do lease ground for grazing. Um, and uh, Sunny, uh, offline <laughs> from this workshop, uh, I'd love to talk with you because there are also um, trust lands and sort of the agreements for grazing or use of, of tribal trust lands. Uh, also sort of like another layer of complexity in the conversation about land access and land leasing. Um, and uh, I think that there's, um, the conversation today is sort of more focused, I think on um, private leasing than permitting of uh, public land or publicly managed land, which in some ways I think tribal land would fall into that category a little bit because there's a, a government rather than an individual that is making decisions about um, those leases. But uh, I think that that could be its own entire webinar. So anyway, the short answer, uh, Sunny, is I'd love to chat with you more um, about that uh, when we see you in person at the conference. Do you have any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Any any young people that have a question that hasn't hasn't spoken up yet? We just had a question come into the chat from Richard King. Um, liability insurance, who pays? Well, that's, that's variable depending on the lease agreement. Um, generally, the landowner always carries liability insurance or should, so that if somebody comes on their property and is injured, they have a, they have a way to uh, not get sued for that and, and you know, have some insurance against being sued for that rather. Same thing with a livestock owner generally. Uh, we will carry liability insurance with our herd and, and we've got an agreement with our insurer that we, they need to know where they are. And uh, it's not very much, the premium's not very high, but if one of our animals would injure somebody then and they sued us and we would have some insurance against that. So it, you, can, you can get insurance either way. And from a grazer standpoint, um, I, you know, if you, are kind of working autonomous, autonomously, I would recommend having maybe some liability insurance, but also a lot of liability for that grazer should be basically mitigated through the contracts with the livestock owner and the landowner so that you have a, you know, clarity around what, what you're liable. And a lot of times within those contracts, that liability goes back to landowners and livestock owners and the, the grazers left mostly without a whole lot of liability unless they go over like their uh, death loss or, or something along those lines. And, and if you're an independent contractor, then you're responsible for your own health insurance and your own. Uh, but if you're working for somebody else, then you've got workman's comp or, or something like that. So, you know, uh, but having some insurance is important because uh, if you get hurt and there's nobody to help, then that that's, that's not a great thing. And another thing concerning insurance that, um, you know, especially getting started in leasing or once you're maybe established a year or two in um, is thinking about getting maybe a, some sort of drought insurance so that you can mitigate um, just natural, natural occurrences and, you know, help you maintain that lease on a drought year when you might not be able to, to stock it in a way that you thought you, you could originally. 
And I, I don't know if that would be available to a grazer. It would be more of a landowner or the livestock owner, probably. But mm. there may be drought insurance for a grazer. I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. I would, you know, look look to NRCS or FSA for that. Um, another question that just came in from Ed Kennedy: What is the standard length of a lease? One year, two years, seasonal? Um, that can be. That's very subjective. Um, I would recommend from a from a business standpoint and a planning stand long term planning standpoint that you have a a five to ten year lease. I think Greg Judy who um, grazes in the Midwest, his recommendation is 10 years. Um, and that can be difficult to achieve. You might have to start out with a, a seasonal deal or a one to two year lease and then roll into that long term lease because you need to build that, that trust and that relationship with the landowner um, beforehand. We have another question that came in. Um, thank you for the information. This is not a question. Rather something if already gone into, I currently have a verbal agreement with a neighbor who has cattle on our land. The cattle grazes, keep our land fertile while he keeps our hay cut. However, it is not a financial benefit that is, but is working for both of us. Oh, yeah, these things don't always have to be financial. They can be, uh, you know, that's, that's a great arrangement because you are, there is an exchange there of values, whether it's money or not is, uh, not irrelevant, but certainly not important in this instance. So that that's a good example of a non-monetary exchange that has value. And I, I would say if it's if it's working for both parties, um, then it's it's fits that win-win um, kind of description. And like the lease that George and I uh, had this year, we we did something similar where we traded management for for the grass essentially and um it, it worked for us and i it worked for for the landowner as well so it, you can get really creative in how you structure it and it doesn't always have to be like for like where you know dollar for dollar type deal um and I, that goes back to really understanding what what both parties needs and what their goals are at the end, end of the day sarah even if not financial, a written agreement might be helpful just for clarity about agreements in the event that something goes sideways. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, written agreements are critical. I know from experience uh, having handshake deals um, where uh, you get a phone call and you have to get your cows off within the week or something and you don't have anything lined up and it, that that will be a very, very stressful situation. So if you have something in writing to kind of protect yourself from that, that's a big deal. And part of being a stockman and a, and a, a manager or owner of animals is that you're responsible for their well-being for not only today, but six months or a year in advance and, and for their whole lives until, and so, Having these arrangements is all part of stewardship and stockmanship so that you know that those animals are safe and they have a place to go. And so that's, you know, looking at it from, from that angle is, is useful. And I, I think that also ties into to land health too, because if you don't have, you know, a, a long-term grazing plan, um, you, you can end up, if you're in a, a drought year or there's someone on, un, foreseen circumstances that happen and you end up having to stay on a piece of property too long and overgrazing and damaging that property. Um, having that long-term plan really maybe help um, you, uh, you know, avoid that situation or it'll be to maybe overgraze that year, but it allows it for a, a long rest and recovery period in years to come so that you don't end up hurting that land um, anymore and can keep restoring it. We've got a few more minutes for questions if anyone has anything else. There's a hand there. You want to go ahead? I was going to type it out, but 
my fingers, my lips are faster than my fingers. So with the lease, uh, given the, the long-term lease of a five to 10 year lease, um, one of the concerns that I might have would be what, what would the ramifications be of breaking the lease? You know, if, if I got into it two years or three years and it wasn't working for me, would I still be on the hook for the 10 years? How, how does that work? Well, you would write into that lease that uh, I'm assuming you're a landowner or are you a... Uh... I am a landowner, but... Okay, so, yeah, but as a landowner, I would write into that lease. I, I don't know if you, you, you saw the, the example that you can terminate that lease at any time, basically, you know, with, with proper notice. You may have to give them six months or something. Or even a year. Sometimes. Or even a year if it's not working. You know, if it depends on... If you have a uh, somebody's moved a lot of livestock onto your land and there's infrastructure and there's you know all of that being set up, where they have they have a an investment in of of time and in there, then that's going to affect how soon they have to get off. But any of these leases at the down at the bottom there somewhere, it says that either party has the ability to terminate that lease with reasonable notice. And then you would decide what that reasonable notice is. And another way to set up kind of a, a lease and, and do, on that kind of time scale deal is actually working with like a, a rolling lease. So what that can do is let's say you have a three year lease on the property, um, but for each year that you lease it out, another year is added to the back side. And then once you hit that three year mark, you can, you know, a lot of times have in writing in that contract that within a year's notice, um, if you give them a year's notice, that rolling lease is ended and you can can get out. But it does, it's not like you can just go in there and, and have them off your land the next day. You, you, you know, you got to think about what the livestock owner needs. And a lot of times they need time to be able to come up with a different plan um, for themselves. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we've got a question in, uh, can the leasee sublease to another person? Well, that, that's very written into the lease. Uh, most leases are not, you're not able to sublease, uh, but some can. And uh, it just depends on the entity and how you set that up. So, it, you know, that's, that's a good question but it also varies with lease to lease. Uh, For example, I think with uh, the lease that we have in New Mexico right now, we probably will end up setting something up where you can, us being the, the leasee can sublease or bring in other people's cattle essentially and manage the cat, those cattle the way those landowners want their land to be managed. And so we'll, when we sit down with the landowners here this winter, we'll um, discuss that and you know, get their get their feelings about something like that and try to out the situation that works. Um, I know from like a state perspective, like um, in Wyoming. We act, there's a, a lady that she leases a state section out from the, the state of Wyoming, and then we actually sublease that state section from her. So from a, a state government perspective, that is uh, legal. And then also I know with uh, like BLM lands, you can't so much sublease it, but you can bring in other people's cattle and manage the cattle on that BLM. Now with forest service lands, that's a little different. You are not allowed to run any anyone else's cattle's cattle but your own on that lease. And then so that that it just it's pretty uh, variable from yeah in Colorado you can't sublease state land. So yeah, I can't run any, I can't even run anybody else's cows on my state land. So that's it varies. So just be clear. Read, read the read the lease and know who you're dealing with and take the time and know the laws and legality around it. 